Yes, yeah, so hi everyone. Uh, welcome to the Space Science series. Uh, welcome back after the winter break. I hope everyone had a good break. Uh, in Abu Dhabi, obviously, it is more like spring. Uh, we start our webinar series in 2021 with uh, two planets, Mars and Venus. Our today's speaker is Dr. Anna Catalina Plesser. She's from the German Aerospace Center DLR in Berlin, where she's a junior research group leader at the Institute of Planetary Research. She has a background in computer science. Uh, she got her PhD in geosciences from the University of Munster. Uh, she's also a participating scientist in NASA's InSight mission. Uh, in addition to this, she's also leading a working group called Planetary Environments and Habitability of the European Astrobiology Institute, which is a virtual institute of the uh, astrobiology research in uh, Europe. So welcome, Anna, uh, to uh, NYU Abu Dhabi, and uh, the stage is yours. Thank you very much and uh, thank you everyone for attending. I would like to take the opportunity to thank the organizers for inviting me here today to talk about the thermal evolution and present day state of the interior of Mars and Venus. So um, when we look at the terrestrial planets and in particular their thermal chemical history, here this plot that you see at the top shows a typical evolution. When planets form, they store formation energy in their interiors. And this is uh, during the collision and during the early stages of planetary evolution. Now, this formation energy is uh, um, transport in, uh, transformed into heat. And this is being lost uh, through their surfaces during the planetary history and um, showing us the surfaces that we see today. Now, volcanic and tectonic processes, they shape the surfaces and the atmospheres of uh, of rocky planets and moons. And um, the data that we observe today shows an, uh, shows an integrated view of the thermal evolution. And mission data uh, that we have for, for different rocky planets in the solar system can be combined with numerical models in order to constrain the thermal uh, history and to place uh, constraints also on the present day state of their interior. Now, when you look at the solar system, here you see the habitable zone shown as green color. And the habitable zone is the dis distance from the central star at which a planet can host liquid water on, on its surface. And we know that uh, this is the case for the Earth, and Earth uh, lies uh, in the middle of the habitable zone, as you can see here. Now, Venus and Mars, they both lie at the edges of the habitable zone. And while today, neither Venus nor Mars uh, host liquid water at their surface, the situation might, might have been different during the past. And it's specifically interesting to look at Venus and Mars because they are ideal candidates to study mantle melting and volcanic outgassing. Both planets have, been, um, uh, have, have had volcanic activity during most of their uh, thermal chemical history and uh, they might still be volcanically active uh, up to the present day. They both represent end members in terms of the present day atmosphere. And while on Mars, we have a very thin atmosphere with uh, six millibars, so less than hundred times um, uh, um, the pressure, uh, the atmospheric pressure that we have on earth, on Venus, we have a very thick atmosphere with 92 bars more than 100 times, uh, about 100 times uh, higher than what we have on, on Earth. And it would be basically the pressure that you would feel when diving at about one kilometer below uh, in, in the ocean. And we have data from uh, planetary missions that are relevant for their interior, but in particular for their surface and atmospheres. And uh, this data can be used uh, in order to, uh, to make the link between the surface observation and atmospheric observations uh, to the interior evolution. And in particular, these two uh, planets, they uh, offer us examples of diversity of evolutionary paths in the, uh, in the solar system, and they, um, they can help us understand the evolution of the Earth. Now here in particular, I will look at the interior of Mars and Venus, and I will focus on numerical modeling that we can employ in order to understand their thermochemical history and uh, their thermal state of present day. 
So let's start first with the interior dynamics of Mars and look at the thermo uh, thermochemical history of the planet. Now we have uh, a number of constraints about the interior and thermal evolution of Mars, and I will mention here a couple of them. So probably the most striking feature that you can observe on Mars is the, um, uh, is the dichotomy, the hemispheric dichotomy. As you can observe here at the top, we observe differences uh, between the uh, topography of the southern highlands and the northern lowlands. And this uh, dichotomy is also um, thought to extend to the crustal thickness, such that the crustal thickness will also show a similar pattern with uh, thicker crusts in the, in, the, um, in the southern hemisphere compared to the northern hemisphere. And in terms of the bulk of the Martian crust, uh, photogeological estimates um, um, uh, give us um, the indication that the, uh, the bulk of the crust has been built during the early stages of planetary evolution. So, so during the first 500 to 700 million years with little addition afterwards. Now, another important constraint that we will see later for thermal evolution models is the elastic lithosphere thickness. And we have elastic lithosphere thickness estimates throughout the uh, thermal history of, of Mars. And this is shown here on this plot. You see the elastic uh, lithosphere thickness versus time. And these dots uh, indicate the estimates that we have with their uncertainty in age and, um, and elastic thickness values. And what you can observe here is that basically during the early evolution, we have small elastic lithosphere values, which uh, are indicative of a hot interior. And with time, this elastic lithosphere thickness increases, showing a cooling of the planet through time. And in addition to that, we have seismic uh, recordings from Mars uh, from the InSight mission uh, that is now operating uh, for, uh, for more than two years on, on the Red Planet. And uh, InSight has recorded more than 480 seismic events um, that can be used in order to constrain the activity of the planet and also put constraints on the thermal history of Mars. Now, a couple of words about the modeling that we are doing here that, and uh, that we will see throughout the, the presentation. So here for Mars, we are using 3D thermal evolution models and we include spatial variations of the crustal thickness. And this is what you can see here. Um, this is a typical crustal thickness model that has been derived from gravity and topography data. And you see here the crustal thickness variations with a thick crust um, covering volcanic provinces, like for example, Tarsus here. And you see thin crustal regions in basins like um, here, Hellas, Isidis, or, um, um, or here, Utopia. And um, these crustal thickness models are um, uh, non-unique. Uh, they mostly depend on the assumed minimum crustal thickness, and also uh, they depend on the crustal density, uh, on, the, on the density difference between the crust and the mantle. And therefore, uh, in our models, we vary the crustal thickness model uh, that we employ. Um, and here you see different models of the crustal thickness that we have used in our thermal evolution uh, calculations. The, um, the black curve here shows the crustal thickness histogram for the exact model here on the left hand side. The red model here shows um, a crustal thickness models, model in which we have um, assumed that the density of the northern lowlands is um, higher um, and therefore the crustal thickness dichotomy is being uh, reduced. So we have a dichotomy in crustal density that reduces the crustal thickness dichotomy. And the blue model that you see here is one extreme model, it's uh, the most extreme model where we have a high density crust that leads to a thick uh, crustal, average crustal thickness and to the largest crustal thickness variations. And we use this kind of models together with the thermal evolution and look at the effects that crustal thickness variations have on the thermal history and on the present day thermal state of Mars. So in, in particular, we are investigating the dynamics in the interior of the planet, and we look at the spatial and temporal evolution of the mantle flow. So we are solving fluid dynamical conservation e equations on a fixed grid, as you can see here on the, on the left-hand side. And um, we investigate the thermal uh, evolution of the planet. And I will show here a simulation showing uh, a typical output where you see 
um, hot upwellings transporting heat from the deep interior towards the surface. And uh, you'll see also here in blue color, uh, cold downwellings that sink into the interior and efficiently cool the mantle. And this is a typical evolution where you see how the planet loses its heat and cools uh, throughout time. Now, in terms of uh, observations, so let's look at the present day Martian seismicity. Now, Mars is a one plate planet. And um, in contrast to the Earth, where plate tectonics is the main driver of uh, seismic uh, activity on Mars, um, the main source of seismicity is the internal cooling and largely the straight loads such as Tarsus, for example. And here you see a map with um, uh, folds shown in different colors. You see here extensional folds associated with the buildup of, uh, of Tarsus. And you see in green um, compressional folds that are associated with the planetary cooling and contraction. And one, um, one thing um, is to mention here is that um, these folds, they are present on a variety of surfaces that have a variety of ages. And therefore it's difficult to, um, uh, to, to assess which of these folds are still active today. But probably the most unequivocal um, evidence that Mars is uh, seismically active today has been delivered by the InSight mission. So as I mentioned before, InSight is measuring the seismic activity of the planet. And here on this plot, you see a moment frequency diagram uh, that has been derived from, uh, uh, from the InSight data. And as comparison, you see here the seismicity of the moon uh, um, estimated from uh, shallow moonquakes here in, um, uh, in gray color. And you see here a predicted seismicity of Mars um, based on the distribution of surface folds. You also see as a comparison, the Earth global um, uh, seismicity, which is dominated, as I said before, by plate tectonics that lies well above uh, the other lines. And you also see here the estimates uh, for intraplate uh, seismicity. Now here you see the observed Mars seismicity, and you see here the rescale seismicity to the whole planet. And uh, the differences between these lines is that um, the data that has been, been used to estimate uh, the seismicity of Mars here uh, was only spanning about 230 souls. So this was um, um, rescaled to the entire year in order to have um, uh, seismicity for the entire year. In addition to that, uh, faint and distant events of, um, uh, on, on Mars will remain undetected by InSight, which is located here. Uh, so this was also rescaled to account for the whole planet seismicity. Also, in addition to that, uh, InSight can only observe uh, during a specific time of day uh, due to the noisy environment on Mars, and therefore events that would take place in times of turbulent winds uh, will remain undetected. So this was also used in order to rescale the seismicity and to obtain a global uh, annual seismicity of Mars, as you see here. But we can use our thermal evolution models and compare to the inside data. And um, here you see the estimates of, um, of the contributions of different uh, physical processes to the seismic moment of the planet at present day. And basically what we do, we run a large number of thermal evolution models and we estimate the seismogenic volume uh, based on an isotherm which marks the depth of plastic behavior of resulting material. And this isotherm is about uh, 1073 Kelvin. And we look at the contribution uh, to the seismic moment from cooling stresses, which are associated with planetary cooling and contraction, and from convective stresses, which are more um, uh, sensitive to the interior dynamics of the planet. Now, what's important to mention here is that these two are anti-correlated, and I will explain why. So the cooling stresses, the highest contribution from cooling stresses, as you see here on this plot, comes uh, from the Northern Hemisphere. Here we have a thinner crust, and in this case, um, the cooling is more efficient. Therefore, also the highest uh, cooling stresses. On the other side, for convective stresses, the highest contribution comes from the Southern Hemisphere. And this is due to the fact that here we have a thicker crust, which is better insulating the interior, keeping the interior warm, and allowing uh, more easily for, uh, for deformation. 
And we, when we combine these two together, we can, we can obtain the distribution of the total seismic moment. And then we can com compare this kind of distribution with uh, the distribution of um, uh, that has been uh, observed by inside. So here, for example, you see the inside landing site here as this uh, yellow triangle. And you see in shaded areas, you see the epicentral distances of, uh, Mars, quake, of Mars quakes that have been detected by inside. Now, two of these quakes have been precisely located in the Cerberus Fossil region. This is a volcano te tectonic region on Mars, um, where lava flows with stages between uh, several tens of millions of years um, and several hundreds of millions of years have been detected. So in geological times, uh, timescales um, uh, very, very early. Uh, now, in addition to that, uh, here you see another event that has been located um, that is a, more, uh, a, a bit more distant, but also has a higher uncertainty. Now we can also um, look at our models and estimate the moment frequency diagram that we have seen before. So here you see um, this diagram that shows in comparison the um, seismicity derived from deep moon quakes here in color and from shallow moon quakes here in, um, in black line, as well as the seismicity of the earth um, here at the top from a catalog from 1976 to 2013. And here, all these models that you observe here are um, predictions uh, that come uh, from fault distribution on, on Mars. And the green area shows the dynamical models that I have uh, presented before. And we can compare this with the estimated seismicity by InSight with the derived seismicity from InSight data. And you see that um, uh, the derived seismicity from InSight data lies well within the range of, of the models that uh, have been predicted. Now, what we can also do in, in these models uh, is to estimate the seismogenic depth. This is the depth at which seismic events can originate. And this is what you see here on this, on this diagram. Each line represents one 3D thermal evolution model. And the seismogenic depth has been uh, determined at present day. And what you can observe is that, for example, um, uh, this, high, uh, th this uh, density dichotomy crust and the classical crustal thickness models, they predict a seismogenic depth up to 250 kilometers, but a, a dense crust, a thick crust that contains nearly all the heat producing elements uh, of the planet uh, can extend the seismogenic depth up to 450 kilometers. So basically, if a deep seismic event would be observed, that could help us to uh, disprove uh, and con confirm some of the models. Specifically, that would mean that um, uh, we would be looking at a, at a thick crust that is highly enriched in heat producing elements, and therefore that we have a cold and uh, depleted mantle uh, uh, and lithosphere. Now, in addition to the seismicity, we can look at the elastic lithosphere thickness. And the elastic lithosphere thickness is a proxy for the surface heat flow and for the temperature of the lithosphere. Now, when you look at this diagram here, here you see a load on, on the surface. This can be a volcanic um, a construct or a polar cap. And uh, basically, under the weight of this load, the lithosphere, the, the surface will deform. And this deformation is um, sensitive to the temperature, to the th thermal state of the layers below. And with this, uh, we can put constraints on the, thermal, uh, on the thermal structure of the planet. Now, as I mentioned before, we have several estimates of the elastic lithosphere thickness that are available throughout the Martian history. And here you see a map with uh, different locations at which the elastic lithosphere thickness has been estimated. Um, and you see also in, in color the age of the surfaces for which they are representative. Now, for example, here, the elastic lithosphere thickness estimates for large volcanic centers, they are um, uh, less reliable. Um, they have lar larger uncertainties because uh, volcanic centers are being built over billions of years. Now, the most important ones for the study that I'm presenting here, the most important estimates are the ones at the South and North Pole of Mars. And this is due to the fact that they are represent they are considered to be representative to the thermal to the present day thermal state 
um, because they um, they are uh, sensitive to the um, to the formation of polar caps and the polar caps formation it takes place on um, uh, on a time scale of several mil million years. And how is this done to estimate the elastic lithosphere thickness at the polar caps here specifically for the North Pole? What you see here is the North Pole and you see the thickness of the ice cap that has been determined from radar measurements. So each dot that you see here is a radar uh, measurement. What is important to look at is this region, Gemina Lingula, for which you see here a radagram. You see the North Polar layer deposits with, which make up the polar cap. You see here the basal unit, which is a unit consisting of ice and, and dust mixture. And you see here below the base of the, of the polar cap. And you see that the surface here shows very limited deflection. So it, it, it is not considerably bended uh, below the polar cap. And you can use flexural models, as it is shown here, to match uh, the deflection beneath the polar cap. And uh, these kind of models suggest that the elastic lithosphere thickness needs to exceed 300 kilometers at the North Pole, um, which in turn would be indicative of a cold and thick lithosphere at this location. So this 300 kilometers at North Pole is necessary in order to explain the limited deflection. And we can use this estimate um, in order to place constraints on the thermal state. And we do so by running uh, the 3D thermal evolution models with crustal thickness variations, as you can see here at the top. And we can estimate from these models the surface heat flow and the surface heat flow variations, as well as the elastic lithosphere thickness, as you can see here. Now, what's um, uh, interesting to look at here is that uh, both the surface heat flow and the elastic lithosphere thickness correlate with the crustal thickness, uh, but they are um, uh, anti-correlated. So regions where we have a thick crust, we have a high heat flow, and uh, conversely, the elastic lithosphere thickness is, is low. In the, on the other hand, in basins where the crust is uh, thinner, we have a lower heat flow and uh, a high elastic lithosphere thickness. You can also observe the signature of mantle plumes here around Hellas and in Tharsis. However, they introduce only slight variations. And we can look specifically in our models at the North and South Pole of Mars and compare exactly with the estimates in the elastic lithosphere thickness. So to do this, we have uh, ran a large number of 3, uh, 3D spherical models. Um, so we look at the entire thermal evolution of the planet and specifically we take the present day in order to compare with the elastic thickness estimates. So here on this plot, each dot represents a, three, uh, a 3D model and the colors represent the average crustal thickness. So we vary in these models, the crustal thickness, the rheology, the initial conditions, to some extent, the crustal enrichment and heat producing elements and the crustal conductivity. And um, what you can see here is that in order to match both the elastic thickness at the North Pole and at the South Pole, uh, only models that are located in this area here in the right quadrangle, um, top right quadrangle, um, uh, are, um, uh, can, be, uh, can be used. So basically we need models that suggest uh, uh, that, that have a higher um, um, elastic thickness at the North Pole higher than 300 kilometers and at the South Pole higher than about 110 kilometers. Now we can use additional constraints in order to uh, reduce the range of uh, admissible models. And for this, we can use the um, volcanic activity as a constraint. So we know on Mars that the volcanic, uh, volcanic activity has decreased uh, over time and has become more and more focused in large volcanic provinces like Tharsis and Elysium. And specifically in Tharsis, um, lava flows uh, that are as recent as 2.4 million years ago have been detected. So that means that Mars has been recently uh, able to produce partial melt in its interior. In addition to that, we can use uh, petrological analysis of Martian meteorites and surface rocks 
and estimate the potential temperature uh, in, the, in the interior of Mars. So here you see the potential temperature evolution through time, here being present day. And what is um, uh, important to, to see here is that the temperature, the potential temperature decreases through time, indicating a cooling of the planet. But we have these two samples here that uh, plot uh, above, uh, uh, above to higher values. And this have been suggested to be indicative of mantle plumes in the interior of Mars. Uh, close to the, to the present day. And we can use these estimates together with the volcanic activity in order to uh, constrain further the, uh, the range of admissible models uh, in, in our study. So if you include now the estimates, the constraints from the volcanic activity and uh, from, um, uh, from uh, um, petrological uh, analysis, then you can reduce this um, range of admissible models to, to this area here. Uh, in addition, a more recent study has reevaluated the uh, elastic lithosphere thickness at the North Pole and has found that the elastic lithosphere thickness at the North Pole is, um, uh, lies between 330 and 450 kilometers. So this is basically the final range uh, that we obtain in terms of models. And this indicates um, um, a moderate uh, uh, average crustal thickness. Now, one thing to mention here, because this is a very important assumption that, um, that is uh, present in, in this kind of models, is that the uh, elastic lithosphere thickness, both at the North and South Pole, uh, assume um, uh, elastic equilibrium. That means that the deflection that we see today uh, beneath the polar cap is also the final deflection. This may not necessarily be true, and this uh, could shift the, this ranges to lower values. Uh, and this is, uh, 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 this is uh, sensitive to the viscosity of the uh, lithosphere and the, uh, of the interior. So in future studies, this has to be taken into account to understand how this uh, shifts the, the results. Now, what we can also see in our models, uh, especially the, the models that um, fulfill uh, the constraints that we have, is that um, uh, they predict mantle plumes below Elysium and Tharsis, and specifically the plume beneath uh, Tharsis is able to produce partial melt until, until the present day. And if you look at the distribution of mantle plumes in the model here, um, this is a map showing the distribution of mantle plumes, so basically, areas uh, shown by red color indicate the presence of mantle plumes. And here at the top, you see a geological map of Mars uh, where uh, volcanic provinces are indicated. So you see that we have a plume beneath Tarsus, the Tarsus volcanic province, and we have a plume, a fainter one, uh, located beneath uh, Elysium. And we also have plumes around Hellas and uh, here, for example, in Sirtis Mayer. Um, and then to conclude this part, what we have seen is that um, dynamical models can be used to directly link uh, the seismicity to uh, the lithospheric cooling of the planet and also to the thermal evolution of, of the planet. When we uh, take into account constraints from elastic lithosphere thicknesses, assuming elastic equilibrium, so assuming that we see the final deflection beneath uh, the polar cap, um, and we combine this with uh, temperature estimates from uh, uh, volcanic activity and petrological data sets. Um, this seems to suggest that um, uh, uh, that we have a moderate crustal thickness that contains more than half of the total amount of heat producing elements. Now, the INSIGHT mission will place constraints on the crustal thickness of Mars, and this is something that we can use in our models in order to further constrain them and to down select a range of admissible models. What we also see is that uh, models uh, predict uh, that partial melt can uh, still be produced in the interior of Mars and um, uh, basically indicating that Mars may still be active today. But when talking about uh, partial melt production in the interior and volcanic activity, um, we can take a look at, at Venus because this is probably the best um, example uh, in the solar system for uh, volcanic activity apart from, uh, from Jupiter's moon Io. 
Now here is a, is a, a sketch showing how the interior of Venus could look like. And what is important to mention here is that we observe a range of uh, volcanic features at the surface of Venus. Like for example, here, uh, this large lava flows like the ones in Milita Fluctus. We have um, topographic rises like the ones in Indo Regio and Iona Regio. And we also have um, uh, this type of uh, volcanic structures, tectonic structures co named Coronae. And I will come to this a bit later. Now, um, here you see a map from Stofan and Smekra, Smekra from 2005. And you see a map of uh, volcanic features uh, at the surface of Venus. And you see that the surface is dominated by this type of features. You see type one and type two coronae. These are um, uh, tectonic uh, features at the surface of, of Venus that have been linked to the uh, presence of magmatic activity in the interior of the planet. We also observe large lava flow fields. And basically, these edifices that we see at the surface of Venus have diameters between five kilometers to more than 300 kilometers. For topographic rises, they are mostly located in the equatorial region. And in terms of corona, we, uh, we observe more than 500 uh, such structures with diameters between 60 and 1060 kilometers. So this kind of indicates that Venus uh, has been uh, volcanically active in the past and might still be volcanically active at, at present day. And uh, one more indication about um, the uh, volcanic activity on, on, on Venus comes from emissivity data. So this data from uh, Venus Express um, has identified um, uh, several regions on, on Venus where fresh unweathered basalt uh, is present. And that means that at these regions, um, recent volcanic activity must have been taking place. So coming again to the corona features, here's a typical uh, plot, a, a, a typical picture of, uh, of this kind of uh, structures. You see they have uh, concentric fractures. And um, as I said before, they are indicative of, um, of uh, magmatic activity in the subsurface. Now here you see a study from, uh, uh, from last year where the authors have um, uh, looked at different types of, of coronae and they have um, uh, distributed them into two categories where um, ongoing uh, activity, um, a plume a lithosphere interaction uh, might still uh, exist today and uh, another type of coronae where uh, the plume um, uh, would have retreated and left uh, behind only the topographic uh, feature that we see at the surface. And what's important to mention here is that um, the elastic lithosphere thickness that we remember is um, uh, it's uh, important to place constraints on the thermal um, uh, on, on the thermal state. Um, uh, the elastic lithosphere thickness at Corona is shows very small values, as you can see here. Now, um, a study by Anderson and Smekar in 2006 um, have used gravity and topography data in order to produce this map of elastic lithosphere thickness uh, on, on Venus. And you see uh, this map ranges, uh, the elastic lithosphere uh, thickness values range between zero and 100 kilometers. And here it's important to mention that the values, um, uh, large values are also present in regions with poor data coverage. Now, um, this indicates that more than half of the planet show, uh, shows best fit values of an elastic thickness of 20 kilometers or even lower. And um, still the main question remains, what is the average elastic little sphere thickness on Venus? Are these small values uh, representative uh, for the average uh, elastic little sphere thickness on Venus? Now, because I mentioned before that um, a small elastic little sphere thickness is indicative of, um, of uh, of a hot temperature in the subsurface and is potentially related to ongoing magmatic activity, um, it is important to look at magmatic intrusions. So we have um, on the Earth, uh, we know that magmatic intrusions exist at different depths. And here you see um, a recent study that has looked at the effects of magmatic intrusions on the surface mobilization. So here you see when hot material is being placed into the lithosphere, it can um, mobilize uh, the material here, and it can delaminate parts of the crust or even induce subduction. And here is a, is a simulation to show you how this looks like in a dynamical model. 
So here you see um, here mantle plumes that uh, rises that rise to the surface, and when they produce melt, intrusive melt is being placed uh, in the crust and lithosphere, and leads to a kind of like a delamination of of the upper layers. And you see here um, the um, uh, the effects on the on the dynamics. You see how material is being transported back into the into the interior. And you see that, for example, at specific regions where magmatic intrusions are placed, the temperature is being um, increased and uh, the, um, the material is being able to, to flow. Now, um, the specific models that we, were, uh, that we are going to look at here um, are 2D spherical module, uh, models with a high resolution. And we, we need this high resolution in order to, um, to investigate the effects of magmatic intrusions. In the, in the models, we are using uh, variable viscosity and thermal conductivity. And since the depth uh, dependence of viscosity and thermal conductivity are poorly constrained, um, we vary this depth uh, in, in our models, the, this depth dependence. Now, uh, one of the most important features of the models is, the, uh, is that we take into account the effects of heat pipe magmatism. Heat pipe magmatism, um, we have here two scenarios. In one, we have full extrusive magmatism in which the melt that is being produced in the interior is entirely extracted at the surface where it rapidly uh, cools to the surface temperature and it pushes down cold material that efficiently um, uh, cools the upper layers. Now, in the case of extrusive and intrusive magmatism, only part of this melt will reach the surface, whereas the other part will remain uh, stuck in the, uh, in the near surface, and it will heat up uh, the, the near surface layers, and um, we will look at the effects of this kind of, uh, of, of process. Now, uh, the extrusive to intrusive ratio can, uh, can be significantly uh, different and can vary between geological provinces and also with time. And for this, we have varied this in our models in order to understand uh, its, its effects. And uh, what is important to mention here is that uh, intrusive melt can significantly affect the elastic lithosphere thickness on, on Venus. And we, we will look at this uh, in, the next, uh, in the next slides. Now, uh, also an important thing to mention is that what we are um, estimating from our models is the mechanical thickness of the lithosphere. So the mechanical thickness of the lithosphere can be calculated uh, based on the thermal state of the lithosphere and on the um, rheology of the mantle and crust. So it marks basically a, a rheological boundary. And here on this plot, you see a strength envelope. You see here the elastic thickness and the mechanical thickness. So you see the relation between the two. What is important is that the, the two are correlated with each other. That means small uh, elastic thickness also requires a small mechanical thickness. Uh, but um, the mechanical thickness represents always an upper bound for the elastic lithosphere thickness. And this is uh, important to keep in mind that the values that we will see uh, later in the presentation are upper bound values for the elastic lithosphere thickness. And uh, we will look at the implications of intrusive magmatism for the mechanical lithosphere thickness and therefore also can give implications for the elastic lithosphere thickness. So here you see a comparison between two models in which we did not use heat pipe magmatism. And uh, in the other model, we have assumed that only 20% of the melt reaches the surface, whereas 80% remains intrusive. And you see here the mechanical thickness as a function of time. And what you can observe is that the mechanical thickness, the average mechanical thickness shown here in full color um, is significantly reduced when this, is in our, when this kind of scenario takes place. And what you can also observe is that the variations of the mechanical thickness are um, uh, considerably enhanced uh, when considering uh, this kind of uh, magmatic style. And this is due to the fact that when we place uh, hot material in the, uh, in the near surface, um, we uh, increase the temperature and decrease um, the mechanical thickness locally. Uh, whereas uh, next in, in adjacent regions, the mechanical thickness can be significantly higher. So then we observe this, um, this uh, uh, large variations and we see that uh, with time the planet cools, the magmatic activity declines and um, 
the mechanical thickness increases. Now, because I mentioned before the effects of um, viscosity and thermal conductivity increase with depth, we have looked here at uh, several models in which we varied the viscosity and the thermal conductivity. And we see here the effects of these two parameters on the dynamics of Venus. So here on the left-hand side, we have a model in which the viscosity and thermal conductivity um, only uh, in, uh, limit, uh, increase for, with a limited um, amount with depth. And here what you see is the residual temperature. This, is the, uh, this shows the temperature variations in the interior uh, compared to the average temperature. And what you can observe in this model is that uh, plumes and downwellings are very thin and very faint. So you see that in this case, um, uh, the interior has a nearly homogeneous temperature. Now, in the second case here, we increase the depth uh, dependence of the viscosity and uh, we, you see the effect here. So in this case, we have more pronounced and more focused mantle plumes and downwellings compared to the previous case. And if we increase the depth uh, dependence of the thermal conductivity, then uh, we see the effects of having a more pronounced uh, conductive heat transport uh, compared to the previous case. And this leads to more diffuse plumes and downwellings. And we can take a look at these effects on the mechanical thickness evolution. So here you see the mechanical thickness evolution for this uh, three uh, selected models. So you see that on average, the mechanical thickness is very similar between the models. But what is important to uh, note here is that the variations are uh, somewhat different. So the largest variations are attained for a model with a, um, uh, with, a, with a large depth dependence of viscosity and a small depth dependence of thermal conductivity. And this is the model that also shows the largest uh, thermal variations. And uh, the smallest variations in the mechanical thickness is obtained, are obtained for a model with a small depth dependence of viscosity and thermal conductivity. And this is the model that shows the smallest uh, uh, temperature variations. But let's take a look at the effects of the intrusive melt on the elastic lithosphere thickness uh, by looking at the effects on the mechanical thickness. So here, we're using a moderate increase of viscosity and thermal conductivity with depth. And in this case, we assume that 20% of the melt will reach the surface, whereas 80% of the melt will remain intrusive. And we vary the intrusive depth here between 45 and 135 kilometers. Here you see again the mechanical thickness, the average mechanical thickness in uh, full color as a function of time and the mechanical thickness variations. You see that the smallest mechanical thickness is uh, attained for a model that has shallow intrusions, whereas the thickest mechanical thickness is attained for the model that has uh, deep intrusions at the base of the lithosphere. And what you see also is that the model's approach towards present day indicating a decline in magnetism. Also, what is important to note here is that the largest variations in the mechanical thickness are obtained for uh, the model where uh, intrusions are shallow. And we can also do the exercise by, uh, again, using a, a moderate increase of viscosity and thermal conductivity with depth. But in this case, we keep the intrusive depth at four, uh, 45 kilometers below the surface uh, and vary the uh, extrusive to intrusive ratio between a purely intrusive model that you see here at the bottom to a purely extrusive model that you see here at the top. So here the entire melt remains uh, stuck in the, uh, in the near surface, whereas here the entire melt can reach the surface. And you see that the mechanical thickness here shown as the average mechanical thickness versus time increases with uh, increasing amount of melt that reaches the surface. Again, you see that the models approach towards present day indicating a decline in, uh, in magnetism. And we can also look at the variations of these models. Here I'm only showing three extreme models. So here again, the purely extrusive model shows large variations in the uh, mechanical thickness. But even uh, with these variations, the mechanical thickness is significantly larger compared to models that a significant amount of melt remains intrusive. And uh, this indicates that um, for Venus, uh, we, we would need um, uh, a significant amount of melt to remain intrusive in order to better be compatible with the estimates of uh, elastic lithosphere thickness. 
Now, in addition to that, intrusive melt can lead to surface mobilization. And this is shown here on this plot. You see the velocity magnitude in centimeters per year. And what is uh, uh, interesting to look at here is this part at the top, where you see that uh, locally the uh, velocity has increased. This is a region where uh, uh, intrusive melt has been placed. And um, this leads to a uh, surface mobilization, uh, as shown here. In the, uh, in the residual temperature plot. So you see how cold material sinks into the interior and pushes aside hot material that reaches uh, uh, near, uh, uh, near the surface. And this surface mobilization is also observed on the mechanical thickness evolution, where you see here an abrupt drop, uh, drop on the mechanical thickness plot. And this, is, this occurs at a time where hot material is being pushed aside and um, reaches shallow depths. So also to conclude this part, uh, we have seen here that magmatic intrusions can significantly affect the mechanical and hence the elastic lithosphere thickness. Um, we see that uh, thick uh, mechanical thickness is obtained when considering uh, purely extrusive magmatism, so considering that the entire melt reaches the surface, and um, we see a significantly reduced uh, uh, mechanical thickness and also elastic thickness uh, when a melt remains trapped at shallow depths. So this uh, can be better reconciled with the low elastic lithosphere thickness estimates that we have for Venus. And we have also seen in our models that intrusions uh, are important uh, because these can lead to surface mobilization and um, especially if shallow intrusive melt is, uh, uh, is, is available. And this can be an effective way of um, uh, periodically uh, resurfacing, um, uh, resurfacing the top layers and uh, leading to a young uh, age of, uh, of the surface as it is uh, observed for Venus. So to conclude the entire uh, presentation, what we have looked at here um, are thermal evolution models in order to constrain the thermal history of Mars and Venus. And we have seen how we can combine these models uh, with, um, uh, with observation in order to understand the volcanic and tectonic uh, processes that have been active and are still active on Mars and Venus. And we can use this kind of models in order to link the interior evolution to surface observations. In addition to this, these models uh, provide an um, important tool to support the overall in, uh, interpretation of mission data. And combined with surface observations, uh, these kind of models help us to understand the diversity of evolutionary paths of uh, rocky planets in the solar system and beyond. And with this, I will end here. And thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. All right. Thanks a lot, Anna. Yeah, so we uh, have a couple of questions. Uh, Ambrish, uh, let me uh, enable you. Uh, can you can ask a question, Ambrish? Uh, hello, can you listen to me? Yes. Yeah. 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 So uh, yeah, it was a nice presentation. I just wanted to ask, uh, like, uh, what kind of parameters and equations do you use to uh, run your models? So um, uh, these are fluid dynamical models. That means we are solving the conservation equations for mass, momentum, and energy. And uh, depending on the processes, the physical processes, additional um, features are, um, are selected in the models. Like for example, for melting, we include the effects of um, latent heat and also okay. this effect of a melt, uh, um, uh, uh, melt extrusion, basically. So whether we have the melt entirely at the surface or being placed in the in the lithosphere, um, uh -huh. we can also uh, the uh, some of the um, results that I've uh, shown um, also based are based on post processing. So basically, we have the temperature. So the the main um, um, the main quantity that we're looking at is the temperature evolution, and based on the temperature evolution we can estimate then um, um, the elastic lithosphere thickness, the mechanical lithosphere thickness, and, okay. um, uh, and, and other, other, uh, other parameters, yeah. Okay, uh, maybe another short question. Uh, so uh, like, uh, do you include uh, crust and mantle uh, as different systems? Like, uh, how do you differentiate between them? Or they are just one system uh, when you simulate your model or something? 
So uh, for, for example, the crust in our models has a lower thermal conductivity, which means uh -huh. that the crust has an insulating effect, a blanketing effect on the mantle and keeps okay. the, the mantle warm. But the crust yeah. is also more enriched in heat producing elements compared okay. to, the, to the interior. Um, okay. So these are two competing effects that, that, uh, that we take into account. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. We have another question from William Moore. I'm going to, yeah, William, go ahead. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Anna, thank you for a great talk. Um, uh, you, you brought up the some of the melting parameters that you include. Did you look at variations in, for example, the solidus temperature or the melt productivity for Venus to see the uh, impact of that on crustal thickness variations and mechanical thickness variations? So at the moment, uh, we have used a, a constant solidus, but you are right, the solidus um, uh, basically increases when you extract um, uh, the, the melting components to produce the crust. So this is something that we need to account for in, uh, in, future, uh, in future models. Um, we have looked at this for Mars uh, when we uh, estimate the, um, uh, the um, uh, whether Mars is still um, producing melt in the interior today. And uh, uh, in, in that case, we have, um, uh, we have recalculated the solidus accounting for the fact that, uh, that uh, Mars has produced the crust. And therefore we compared to, to a, um, a solidus of a depleted material in that case. But we didn't uh, do this yet for Venus. Uh, this is still a uh, still work in progress. If I could just follow up. So the, the value mm -hmm. you're using for Venus is an, uh, an Earth sort of number? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, Serini, do you have a question? Yeah, I was just uh, wondering whether um, with respect to these two planets, there are some uh, general models of convection in the interior of the planets. Um, I know that that's what you're doing uh, in your simulations which are wonderful, by the way. I appreciate your talk and it was very nice. But I wonder if somebody has really looked at it um, um, as a problem in convection. Um, so you mean um, um, not really a convection applied to, uh, to uh, model the thermal history of planets, but in general, um, in a more generic way, uh, to, yeah. to look at, at convection. Yeah, exactly, exactly, yes. Yeah, so this kind of models are, um, are, are, usually, um, uh, are, are usually applied for a variety of problems, not necessarily related to the thermal history of, of, uh, of the rest of planets, but using this kind of models in order to uh, quantify the effects of specific physical, um, uh, physical processes. So you often see, uh, see um, uh, um, studies where a specific physical process has been investigated uh, by running a large parameter scale, uh, uh, large parameter um, space of uh, uh, in, with, with this kind of models. Um, we do regularly benchmarks uh, of these kind of models. So um, there are different convection codes available worldwide. And we are using these kind of codes to, to benchmark our <laughs> Uh, our tools. And um, uh, in that case, we don't use a specific uh, um, uh, planets, uh, um, parameters uh, relevant for planets, but we have a, a, a dedicated um, configuration with which we test our, uh, our plans, which is more generic in order to capture better uh, different, different processes. So. Uh, um, yeah, th thank you for this. Uh, you have these uh, wonderful pictures of plumes and things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, how um, seriously should I take uh, the details of those uh, results? Yeah, so basically, um, you're right. Uh, the, the, um, uh, of course, the uh, convection pattern in the interior is barely, uh, very sensitive to, to specific parameters. But for example, uh, specifically for Mars, uh, we have looked uh, whether um, uh, whether we can obtain a specific uh, convection pattern in the interior at present day. And what we see is that, for example, the crustal uh, variations are uh, important for the convection pattern in the interior of Mars. Like, for example, in all our models that were able to fit available observations, we see that we can focus uh, uh, a mantle plume be beneath uh, Tarsis, for example. Yeah. 
So in that case, some specific features in the convection pattern are, uh, are robust, but um, the exact convection pattern is very difficult to, uh, to predict. Thank you very much again. Thank you for the wonderful talk. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Axel, go ahead. Uh, thanks very much for a very interesting and inspiring talk. Um, uh, I have a question regarding the replenishment of surface material. On the Earth, this plays an important role in terms of uh, uh, the oxid, oxidant, oxid, uh, the CO2 cycle, for example. Uh, how does that compare with, uh, with Earth simulations? Is there, um, and what is the, I mean, the significance of the absence of plate tectonics, if that is indeed the case? Yeah, so on, on Mars, um, I think it can be said with uh, a pretty high confidence that plate tectonics um, uh, did not operate uh, potentially during the entire evolution. Um, we don't see um, um, features at the surface that would be indicative of, uh, of plates uh, even early in the, in the thermal history of the planet. Also Mars is smaller than the Earth, so it's, um, uh, there are different studies that have looked at the size of the planet and the uh, propensity of, of, uh, of the planets to develop plate tectonics uh, and, and um, uh, suggested that a small planet may uh, not be um, uh, able to develop plate tectonics. So, um, in terms of Mars, Mars is smaller than the Earth, uh, most likely didn't have plate tectonics, um, therefore also limited uh, surface recycling. Um, now in terms of, of CO2, also the outgassing on Mars, uh, one can think of, uh, of it also as, as a smaller or a limit, more limited than the Earth, um, um, just uh, because um, first of all, in the absence of plate tectonics, a more limited outgassing will take place in any, you know, any way, and Mars is smaller than the Earth and uh, therefore um, uh, has had um, uh, probably a smaller inventory of, of, of volatiles. Now, in addition to that, uh, Mars has most likely lost its atmosphere. Um, on Mars, in the absence of a magnetic field that only operated very shortly during uh, the early stages of, of the planet, um, the, the atmosphere could, could have been efficiently lost. And um, uh, therefore, um, also the, the atmosphere of Mars is much, much thinner than, than we have on Earth. Um, now on Venus, whether Venus um, really had uh, plate tectonics as we have on Earth is not, uh, uh, it's still debated. So, so um, uh, maybe Venus had a more different way of, of surface recycling, more kind of like a surface delamination, which uh, may or may not include, uh, uh, to some extent, uh, the uppermost surface surface layers. Um, and Mars uh, and, and uh, Venus has a very thick CO2 atmosphere, um, and this is also the fact that CO2 cannot be taken out uh, from the atmosphere, as for example is the case for for the Earth. Right on Venus, you don't have this weathering that we have on, on Earth, and then the plates that uh, subduct the, the the material and bring uh, carbonates, for example, uh, in the in the interior and recycle uh, the carbonates. Mm. Thanks very much. There is a question on Q and A, Dimitra. Yeah, so there is a question by anonymous attendee. How about the thermal state of the core? Um, so the thermal state of the core for Mars and Venus, um, at the, I, I mean, in, at the moment, um, we have indications from, um, from modeling. So looking at models, for example, for Mars, looking at the CMB temperatures that we obtain and um, um, assuming the specific composition of the core, we can uh, place constraints on the thermal state of the core. But the exact composition of the core, um, and this goes both for Mars and, and for Venus, is, um, is poorly constrained. So we don't know what kind of light elements we have in the core. Sulfur is uh, perhaps the most, um, uh, the most efficient light element to go into the core, but um, for example, other light elements like os oxygen, uh, carbon, uh, and, and, uh, and other, uh, other elements can go into the core and can affect uh, basically the composition of the core and in turn the melting temperature of, uh, of the core. And based on the melting temperature, one can place constraints whether the core is uh, liquid or partially liquid. Um, so um, this is something that is still, um, um, it's, it, it's work in progress basically. And there are many groups that work uh, to 
uh, to place uh, better constraints on the on the thermal state of the core. All right, thanks a lot. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Anna. Uh, it was a great talk, and uh, Thank you, see you all uh, next week. Yeah, thanks a Thank lot you. again. Very nice. Yeah. Thank you.